Well, hello. Uh, good morning from London. Good afternoon if you're in uh, elsewhere in Europe. Um, thanks very much for joining us for this session on the future of the UK post-Brexit. We could probably talk for it, about it for 45 days, let alone 45 minutes, but we'll see what we can pack in. Uh, I'm Chris Morris, the senior BBC correspondent covering Brexit, among other things, in London, having previously been based in Brussels and other places around the world. Uh, as you know, we've had political Brexit. We've left the institutions of the EU earlier this year. Uh, we're now approaching economic Brexit, departure from the single market and the customs union. What we're not going to do today, I hope, is dive into the weeds of the current negotiations between the UK and the EU on trade and other matters. We all know they're rapidly reaching a critical point. And importantly, I guess, in the context of this discussion, the failure to reach a deal this year would get relations outside the single market off to a very rocky and difficult start. But what I hope we can do today is look a little bit further over the horizon to try to work out what the future might look like on trade and perhaps more generally on Britain's place in the world. So without further ado, uh, with me on the panel today are David Liddington. David was a Conservative MP for more than 20 years and held various ministerial positions, including the famous de facto Deputy Prime Minister, I don't know if that was ever an official title, <laughs> intimately involved in previous Brexit negotiations under Theresa May. Uh, David's now chairman of the Royal United Services Institute, and he tells us on Twitter that he's recently been rereading the Iliad, which sounds to me like the perfect accompaniment to following Brexit. <laughs> um, Susan Kramer, Baroness Kramer, is a Liberal Democrat member of the House of Lords. Uh, she is their Treasury and Economic spokesperson there was formerly an MP representing Richmond uh, Park in the London suburbs uh, and a minister in the coalition government. The Lib Dems, of course, fought very hard against Brexit and un unsuccessfully. Uh, Karen Billamoria, Lord Billamoria, is the president of the Confederation of British Industry and a crossbench or independent member of the House of Lords. He's also, of course, founder and chairman of Cobra Beer and has been heavily involved for many years, among other things, in promoting trade between the UK and India. Uh, Jeffrey Brigginshaw, is not, never has been, as far as I'm aware, a member of either of the Houses of Parliament, but he's a senior business executive and CEO of Transatlantic Business Britain. Uh, and in that role, he's obviously has expertise in the UK's trade negotiations with the United States, which have been going on slightly under the radar compared to the negotiations with the EU. And uh, finally, last but not least, Mike Butcher is editor in, at large at TechCrunch and a regular media commentator on all things technology. Now, of course, the tech sector is much loved by Boris Johnson's senior advisor, Dominic Cummings, who's said to want to use the freedom of Brexit to help create UK-based tech giants. And I'm hoping Mike will be able to tell us whether Mr Cummings might be onto something. Uh, we're going to take a, a couple of minutes from each of the panellists uh, to begin with, um, urging them to keep it brief if possible. We don't have that much time. And there's quite a few of us on the panel. Uh, David Liddington, perhaps you could go first. I think, um, Chris, the, the, if I want to look for positives in this and you know uh, aim off i'm coming at this as an absolutely convinced and unrepentant remainer who accepts the result but um you know thinks that the result was the wrong one in terms of national interest um it, it you need to start with the cabinet ministers who are saying it'll take 50 or 60 years to see the full benefits of of brexit and i think that the regulatory flexibility that one gets outside the eu and the very conservative application of precautionary principle you sometimes get from the eu may give the UK opportunities in some of the new technologies in sort of big data, in life sciences, including GM, uh, in, in, in some of the digital technology fields, um, because the precautionary principle, I think, has been in danger sometimes of driving those uh, industries either to North America or to China. Uh, and actually getting them out of Europe entirely. But whether that does work for the UK depends, it uh, seems to me, on how we confront the biggest risk in all this, which even going beyond, you know, the immediate economic hit from coming out of the single market, and the customs union is going to be, where does the United Kingdom sit geopolitically now? It's part of the democratic Western order, relies on a, 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 a basically US led uh, order at a time when the United States is questioning its historic role as the guarantor of European security and a rules based international order. Um, uh, where even Biden, if he wins, is going to expect Europe, the European democracies, to do more for security and exercise greater global political leadership in places like Africa. And yet we will be outside the room when France and Germany and the other big EU players sit down together to try to hammer out a European response. 
And I think it's going to get more difficult in the world we're going into for uh, a, a, even a, a strong middle sized power like the UK to navigate completely freely between the poles of the United States on the one hand and China on the other. And in trade, you can add the EU into that. And I think those pressures, to what extent is there real national autonomy? Um, where does the UK sit geopolitically is, is, is the big, big challenge facing us. OK, thanks, David. So uh, the big geopolitical questions, but um, Mike Butcher, David mentioned the idea of, of greater regulatory flexibility, which could help tech industries. Well, what, what's the view from the tech sector? Obviously, one of the things people want is access to, to, to people, isn't it, who obviously can't, aren't going to be able to arrive from the European Union quite so readily anymore? Well, yes. And over the last 40 years, people have been able to uh, bring in talent from Europe very easily. No visas, no paperwork. And and, and of course, also, uh, we've be the UK has become an incredible cradle because of its you know, rule of law and its uh, long traditions of, of uh, you know, uh, science and technology to uh, to be a place where so someone could come and, you know, join either uh, academic institutions or technology companies. Uh, very easily. Now, that's all really very much up in the air. And we've got to remember the UK was one of the biggest and most successful um, beneficiaries of the Horizon Europe programme, which is worth 90 billion euros. Um, and uh, and of course, now as a third party country, we will have to pay into that or to access uh, that. But it really the thing is that it's a is that uh, the investors and startups that I talk to every day is that uh, on the startup side, the innovation side, is that they don't talk about the money. They don't talk about state aid. They don't talk about DARPA. They talk about people and talent. And talent is really the, you know, the, the primordial soup from which you get the innovation, you get the startups, and you get the, you know, the Apples, Googles, uh, Facebooks of this world. So to talk, about, um, to talk about state aid, to talk about creating a new DARPA, um, really, it's, it's, it doesn't it doesn't jive with uh, the way that investors and entrepreneurs um, uh, think about things at this point in time. OK, Mike, thanks. Um, Baroness Kramer, Susan Kramer. I mean, we know the Lib Dems hate Brexit, they hate, but, but you say you've moved on. So from the point we are at now, what what is the positive tra trajectory you would like to see going forward? What can what can we gain from the position we are in right now? Well, uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. I'm a dedicated uh, European, but we are where we are and we've got to make the best of it. Mm. Um, but I have to say, I do struggle in trying to see how we make the best of it. And I'm not sure we're particularly well positioned. Look, uh, we leave the Economic Union, as you said, in effect at the end of this year. Uh, so, um, there will be some immediate chaos at the borders that will entertain the media. It will have an impact mm. on a lot of people and businesses. Okay. That troubles me far less than the medium and long term impact, because if I was sitting in Brussels, I'd essentially be saying, look, many of the clients that have made UK industry and services buoyant are here in the EU. There's, uh, uh, there may be capacity in the UK, but you can always move capacity, which you can't move with the clients. And so I think with relatively little nudging, it is be quite possible to encourage market forces to gradually accelerate that sort of flow of investment and jobs that uh, uh, into the 27 at the expense of the UK. I think we're already seeing that. I think people haven't been on top of it, partly because everything is masked by COVID. So I, I am really concerned that in areas like financial services, you know, Dombrovsky has been very clear that uh, warning uh, European company, European finance institutions that they need to look at their derivatives trading and clearing in London and begin to think about how they can transfer that within to the 27. There'll be, there'll be things like that. I'm afraid that the impact of COVID is quite likely to accelerate that change in the sense that so many businesses are having to go back and reconsider who they are, what they are, what they want to do in light of the impact of COVID. And if you're going to make change, then you make a change that encompasses everything that you can see coming towards you. So I, I, have, so, I have some real concerns and concerns about government's blindness to all of this, about its capacity to respond. I know it wants to use state aid as a, a sort of battle mechanism, uh, 
that uh, it very keen on supporting myself, the tech industries and science and innovation, which I think are our best hopes for the future. But you just have to look at the national debt levels and wonder how much capacity there's going to be to drive all of that. But but as I say, I mean, I think um, education, innovation, that, so those are going to be the fundamentals. And it means basically the well-educated, the risk takers, the innovators will all do well. I worry about ordinary people. But I wanted to pick up an issue and then I'll stop that uh, that David raised, which is this idea that we, 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 we now can be competitive in the in the regulatory market. Every company that I talk to says, look, I have to produce goods that meet the regulatory standards that my customers want to see. Mm -hmm. And globally, my customers want European standard. Doesn't matter what it says in the free trade agreement, doesn't even matter what their local rules are. They want the assurance and the quality of European imprimatur. It's almost like the hallmark stamp of the old days of sterling. And that way I can sell without having to have complicated discussions to anyone else in the business chain and to end clients. Now that suggests there's not a lot of space for a new regulatory regime to come storming in and taking over the world, which is what I tend to hear, frankly, from the UK government. Uh, Susan, thank you. Um, Lord Billamoria, either with your CBI hat on or your international business hat on, international businessman hat on running an actual business, what, what are your comments? Chris, thank you very much. And uh, I'm totally open about this. Before the referendum, I was uh, a a terrific Eurosceptic. I didn't like a lot of the way Europe and the European Parliament were. When it came down to the referendum, on balance, I thought it would be better for the UK to remain in the European Union for a number of reasons. And then, of course, we made this decision and we've left. So 31st of January, we've left the European Union. That's a done deal. Now, my attitude is very much, and so is the CBI's, the Confederation of British Industries. Now, how do we make the most of this? And the most important thing is to get a deal. And, I'm, and this is a crucial week. I mean, this is serendipitous, the timing of this uh, particular session. Um, we are keeping fingers crossed uh, that we will get a deal, uh, or, or, or at least we, this week we'll, we're getting to a deal. Now, what sort of a deal it's going to be is probably going to be a very light deal. And my concerns are that security, one of the biggest advantages of being in the European Union is security. In fact, um, I've heard one of the senior leaders in the, in the field um, in the country saying, if only people knew, they would remain in the European Union just for the security benefits. So we must somehow try and retain those security partnerships and benefits. Is movement of people going to be sorted out? Um, you know, Mike mentioned this ease of movement has been such a benefit for business, for tourists, for visitors, just to be freely able to move. Uh, the goods and services and agriculture and fishing is going to be sorted out by the deal, hopefully. But what about financial services that Susan has mentioned? That's not covered by this. What about the, the services? 80% of our industry um, economy is not covered by it. So I have a lot of, but I think if we get a deal, we can then build on it. At least there's a platform then to build on. Now, here's the reality, looking forward to David's point about the geopolitical. And if there's one thing I will disagree with my fellow college member, um, and that is we are not a middle power. And we're not a middle economy. We are the sixth or fifth, depending on the exchange rate and how you measure it, the largest economy in the world. That's a fact. That's we are also a global power. We're not a superpower, but we're very much a global power. We're at the top table of the world, permanent seat of the UN Security Council, one of the second biggest member of NATO, um, Commonwealth. Uh, you know, we are a, a, our security, our hard power, our nuclear deterrent, our 24, our 365 nuclear deterrent that we have. We have strong defense forces, small though they are. And our soft power, and Mike alluded to a lot of this, is, I think, beyond compare. Our universities, along with America, the best in the world. Our culture, creativity, our services, our manufacturing, 10% of our economy is absolutely fantastic. So we have huge capability in this country on our own. Now, the Europe is 50%, almost 50% of our economy. So we have to do business with Europe as easy as possible. America is our biggest trading partner, 15 to 18%, single biggest country. And then, of course, you've got India and you've got China and they're looking forward. So I think and we've, the Japan deal is supposedly done. So I'm optimistic that we can make the most of this situation going forward. Karen, thank you. Um, Jeffries, I mean, obviously, a lot of what you do is look at the, the relationship with the United States. Um, 
anyone watching the debate the other night will know that politics is in flux over there. What, what's what's your perspective on, on looking at the UK's future with, with that transatlantic sort of um, perspective in mind? Thanks very much. And um, I mean, more, more generally, before I come to the US example, which I will do, I, I'm a real skeptic about um, global Britain and uh, sort of trade ambitions, which have naturally been made on the hoof. Um, because of Brexit circumstances. And I think in the medium to longer term, our trade future is about joining up uh, trade negotiations again into some uh, less bilateral context. So instead of US, UK and UK, EU, we should be talking UK, US, EU. So it's about joining up in the medium to long term. Um, in, in the short term, it, it, it's really been more rhetoric than, than reality um, and ex post facto political narrative really, not to my view, sort of grounded in any trade strategy. Uh, I think it will, in the short to medium term, deliver a net negative in open trade terms. So if you're a lamb exporter with a market in the EU, you're not going to replace that in any time soon. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and despite the valiant efforts of, you know, a, a body of new trade negotiators, I just don't see a compare belt with new FTAs. Like US, UK, is a really good example of you know rhetoric and, and reality and and them living in very different spaces you know even with uh, a biden victory uh, i don't think that makes anything more likely uh, a trump victory he still has trade negotiating uh, authority to renew next year um real power on trade doesn't rest with him it rests with a democrat controlled uh, congress uh, uh house of representatives so i, I just don't see a uk USFT getting off the ground very quickly. Uh, I, I think you, you know the the economics, the, the the cultural and social aspects are really difficult for, for us. I'm very interested. We've got legislative colleagues on on this panel as to how they see those trade offs working through politically. When you get to scrutinise um, some of the trade offs that we're going to be asked to make, whether it's on public procurement, drug pricing, or food safety in the middle of a food safety global pandemic. Um, so, so I'm, 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 I struggle to see um, how uh, a US FDA can, can move forward quickly in, in, in the real world. Finally, and, and going back to you know, where does this all take us, trade policy luckily is, is probably overrated, FTAs are overrated, trade promotion, you know, the nuts and bolts of exporters doing what they do and, and making it easier for them and market access is probably more worthwhile um, as, a, as a point of focus and doesn't need trade deals. The, the point I was making about triangulation, putting trade negotiations together rather than uh, sticking to bilateral tracks, tracks is, is, is really where I think we need to focus energy. Um, but, but finally, and really that is, this is what I think we, we, we all really sense is that post-Brexit, the challenge for Britain is, is the challenge and the challenges that we've always had, which is about productivity, innovation, you know, labour market discipline, um, education, um, you know, we know we've had these challenges, we've never solved them, uh, and in, in a way, the solving of them will be our destiny one way or the other, uh, and, and, you know, hopefully with an imaginative approach to those things post-COVID, um, we, we, can, we can do better. Bottom line, if you, if you can come up with an Apple iPhone, you don't really, you're not going to have to worry about trade deals. They're going to sell in foreign markets, and that's about innovation, productivity, education policy behind it. So it's the old stuff that really will be the driver of the, the new stuff. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm just going to pop a few questions out there, and please, whoever wants to ask them, either wave at me or just just, just begin talking. Uh, I want to pick up one thing that, that Susan mentioned, that the, the fear that um, the current crisis with, with the pandemic will accelerate changes in a way that Britain will find challenging. Is there a, is there a counter-narrative to that? Obviously, the virus has upended, upended economic thinking all around the world. Is it not possible that a country that was already upending its economic model, was in the mood for radical change, could just possibly be best placed to take advantage of that? Who wants to start? Mike? Uh, I think that um, there's a very good point in the sense that if you, if you see what's happened with this, uh, the pandemic, we've had five to ten years of digitization shrunk into about three months. Uh, people used to talk about the fact that we would work virtually, we would work from home, we would work remotely, and now they no longer, futurists used to talk about that, now they no longer do, those futurists are now out of work. So 
the digitization of the UK um, is and of the whole of the world, frankly, has happened very, very rapidly. Now, it, it, does that mean, therefore, that the UK is in a, in a position with its so-called uh, freedoms now to be able to uh, rapidly expand upon that uh, opportunity? Potentially, yes. You can't pick strawberries without human beings, for instance. Uh, they've developed robots to do it, but you can't do it unless you grow the strawberries in a particular way. So, but the, and there's no such field that exists in the UK to grow strawberries in that particular way. So, the, the, so yes, you could you could leap forward into the future, but there's no real way of doing it immediately. And uh, I want to uh, hark back to uh, something that was just said earlier about the old stuff, and that's um, education. Um, Bristol, for instance, Bristol University, for instance, has the big, biggest robotics lab in Europe. So there's an opportunity to take advantage there. But where's the policy? Where's the strategy? Um, how are we going to move to this, you know, uh, this uh, the futuristic society of jetpacks and flying cars uh, without some way of, of moving there in a policy direction? Yeah, we have, a comment, we have a comment here from Royston Flood saying the pandemics caused us to challenge mindsets. And I guess that's the point I was, I was going to make. Uh, uh, Karen. Yeah, I, I think, you know, this is a time of crisis quite often leads to lots of change in a dramatic way. I mean, you, you look back to the Second World War in the middle of the Second World War, 1942, uh, we had the Beverage Report commissioned in the middle of a crisis, the world at war. And then what happened with that report? After the war, it led to the transformational change of the National Health Service, the welfare state that has transformed this country uh, that came out of a crisis in the middle of a crisis. And I think here's an opportunity where, uh, apart from the technological adaptation and adaptation that we've been brilliant at around the world, um, we also have the opportunity to look ahead to the bigger picture. So, for example, COP26, the UK is hosting and chairing that next year. We have a great opportunity over there with the 2050 uh, net zero target. The heat commission that I just chaired at the CBI in Birmingham University, where I'm, I'm chancellor, heat is one third of carbon emissions and we haven't addressed it. And if we don't, we've got 29 million ha houses in the UK, one million of them up to stand at the moment, 28 million of them have to be re there's reskilling involved, heat pumps, hydrogen boilers, um, all that needs to happen over the coming months. So we've got a great opportunity actually to look ahead uh, in that. And R&D and innovation, 1.7% of GDP is what we invest in the UK. Germany invests 3.1%, America 2.8%, Israel 4%. We've got to get up to that 2.4%, 2.7%, 20 billion pounds extra a year. Just imagine what we can do to power our economy ahead. And I think this is turbocharging those sort of initiatives. It, it, a lot of it's going to come down to leadership, isn't it, uh, David, Susan? Former, former ministers. I mean, that, that's that's part of it. If, if all the pieces have been thrown up in the air, it's the person that grabs opportunity best. And, and is Britain in a good position to do that, David? I think that at the moment, I think there's a, there is a feeling of, of people being shell-shocked by the impact of COVID mm -hmm. and the economic um, st storms that uh, are following that, and which we, where we've only just begun to see the first wave of um, pressures on employment and on the public finances. I mean, that's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. I think the key thing for whoever is in government is that they, they, they manage to both set a political and economic strategy that follows through on the opportunities that Karen has talked about, and but at the same time addressing those long-term challenges that Jeffrey mentioned we don't have the no one has the excuse now of blaming eu bureaucracy or brussels rules for not sorting out um technical vocation uh, education innovation infrastructure you know we've got to sort that ourselves um and they've then got to link that with a plan on how you deliver it and finance it rather than have different silos in different bits of white all doing that now i think you know one of the the few things I happen to agree with Mr. Dominic Cummings, Boris Johnson's chief advisor, is actually you do need a more coherent centre of government to try to drive cross Whitehall issues through government. But the test is, can they find the thinking space to do that and the political support to do it and the resource to do it at the same time as coping with the fallout from leaving the EU and the dislocation that leads to? and with the impact of COVID, which it is clearly going to be very severe. 
So if I just come in on that, I mean, I'm a great believer that the green revolution and responding to climate change is a huge opportunity. I mean, it's something that at first I believe has to happen. But secondly, because it changes so much, it, it offers enormous potential. But I do think sometimes we talk about it as if we were the one and only country that was picking up mm. this issue. And if I look at the commitments that just sort of France and Germany alone have made, for example, to dominate hydrogen, to dominate the electric vehicle industries, that uh, um, those put into, I mean, when we begin to look as though we're engaged in minutiae here in the UK. I mean, we're focusing, what, three billion pounds on something we ought to be doing, which is that uh, making our homes much more energy efficient. I mean, that needs to be done and should have always been much higher up the priority list. But, uh, um, you know, I, I, our commitment to electric batteries, I think, is nine million pounds at the Faraday Centre, whereas I think we're over a hundred million in Germany and one aspect of battery technology alone. So it, it, it's, uh, you know, I, 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 I think we've got to scale up and have, be far more ambitious than we have been historically. But we have two sets of problems. One is somehow, somewhere, you've got to pay for it. And I don't think anyone has begun to work out how on earth we address that. We're lucky at the moment interest rates are low. You can carry large debt burdens. But uh, I've lived too long to think that cycles don't turn. And, uh, um, you know, the, the second aspect of it is we have real weaknesses in delivery. And I challenge David a bit this centralization process that's going on in government today. Well, I think that if you're going to deliver efficiently, you're going to have to commit to genuine devolution. And that devolution is, is being undermined on an almost hourly basis. But I, I, I mean, just on, on, on that, I can, can just reply to that, that point. I, mean, you know, I completely agree with Susan on that. I mean, I, and I don't see a contradiction between having a coherent, um, more effective centre of government where you have policy making, policy implementation and finance dealt with as a whole, rather than being decided separately, which is too often the case at the moment, and equally devolving real power down to whether it's metro mayors or unitary uh, county authorities uh, who have the convening power, who know the local universities, local businesses, and they're going to be key to actually delivering an industrial strategy, a zero carbon strategy within their own areas. You can't micromanage that from Whitehall. I, I, I complete, I'm with Susan on that point. But so, it was uh, entirely about making making the UK more nimble within. Now, I just wonder what the, the, the image, uh, Jeffries, I think you're going to come in. The image, do you think there is an image of Britain abroad now as a nimble, innovative country post-Brexit? It's going to be dynamic and forward moving or are people scratching their heads and, and thinking, what have you done? I think it's a bit of both and I've been actually sort of comforted by the kind of resilience of, of people's views, taking a long view of our historical reputation to give them confidence as to our future behaviour, but also kind of scratching heads as to sort of asking themselves, why, why would they do this, um, you know, as an exercise in, in self-harm? But I was going to say also that there are always opportunities and there are always going to be opportunities, but it is really key that we, you know, particularly in politics, separate out the rhetoric from the reality. So we were talking about digital uh, potential. And, you know, we've got huge opportunities with digital identity. As we said, that's been crunched forward so rapidly. But they're just not going to be able to move forward unless we get data protection, privacy, right? And unless we get data adequacy with our major data market, which is the EU. So in the real world, to be able to take advantage of the opportunities, you know, politics has to get real and deliver the kind of precaution and comfort to citizens that will allow for the taking of the opportunity on digital identity and the exploration of data access, which we, we need as a services economy, to our major markets, including the European Union. So get real to politics is, is part of the, the, the need, I think. Yeah, I, I think uh, Karen wanted to come in and then Mike. Yeah, no, I just want to say that I, I hear what Susan said and what Dave said, but we also got to be, uh, you know, claim success with wind power when we were doing the heat commission, we are world leaders in wind power, and we did that because we prioritized it. We've got to make things national infrastructure priorities. So the heat issue is not a small issue. It's one third of carbon emissions. Mm. So if we can lead the way and show leadership in this when we're hosting COP26, it's much better to do it when we're practicing what we preach and, 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 and actually doing it and leading by example. So I think we have the capability to do that. 
And one of the things is to have an Olympic style delivery authority, to David's point, to make this happen in, in, in the regions and also in a devolved administration environment. I mean, I come from India, which is a true federal country, United yeah. States, true federal country. We have something different. We have our devolved nations in our regions, and we've got to make it work within that. So I completely agree with that. I just want to pick up on one point that's come up in the in the question and answer, which is about celebrating diversity and inclusion will be a key vector. And that's a serendipitous thing, because just today uh, at the CBI, we've launched uh, Change the Race Ratio, um, encouraging companies to be diverse in their leadership, where at the moment, uh, 37% of FTSE 100 companies do not even have one um, ethnic minority member. And 69% of FTSE 250 members, do, companies do not even have one ethnic minority board member. So we're going to be really working actively on that. One of the uh, one of the points that came up was: um, Are we are we uh, seen as a leading uh, nimble nation? Well, the Russell Group just found that there was uh, an eleven percent rise in EU academics leaving the, their positions for, for in the year following the referendum. That's one data point. Another data point I know for a fact is that you, many UK entrepreneurs are leaving the UK because uh, th their startup businesses won't have access to uh, EU uh, standard standards on data. And data is the new oil. Uh, data is more valuable than oil at this point. Um, and uh, so therefore they're, they're taking their, uh, they're moving to Amsterdam, Lisbon, Berlin, because uh, access to that large market is very, very important. James Anderson of um, Bailey Gifford, uh, has said that geeks, venture capitalists and markets of scale is what that attracts entrepreneurs. And in tech, uh, scale is achieved with data. And so you, you've got to really, uh, data really is, is the key point here. And of course, we don't yet know whether the EU is going to grant an equivalent uh, uh, decision to the EU on data. I just want to move on to the, the, the sort of broader point that, that David was making about Britain's place in the world, the sort of geopolitical question. But it's also a, a regulatory one in a way. I mean, the idea that we, we know the EU is not a, a military superpower, it's not a political superpower, but it is a regulatory superpower. Do we have to choose between being part of the EU's regulatory sphere or the US regulatory sphere? Or can we somehow forge our own path? Who wants to come in on that? David? We have to, we have to try to, to do what someone was say, saying earlier, which was think in terms of Europe, Europe and North America together. One of the things that... It was it a great, like, have your cake and eat it. it well, it's, it's actually what was lay behind the TTIP negotiations a few yeah. years back, where the objective there was to get agreement between the EU and the US in such a way as you would, in effect, start to create a global uh, set of standards, particularly for manufacturing, um, that nobody else in the world could could really get round, that would, would, would become the international norm. And I think that's what we should seek to do. But my, my, my concern uh, uh, is is that it's... It, it, I mean, it depends what happens in November at the US elections to some, to some extent. Um, uh, but... It, it, my concern is that we will end up having to choose uh, one or the other, be, be, be particularly if the EU and the US um, become uh, much more to overtly trading adversaries rather than, than to normal competitors. I think we also get a bit hung up about trade deals. Um, and, and when we talk about the sort of value creation in the modern economy, which is sort of behind the border uh, services, you know, the regulatory context is much more important. And I think there are other forms of economic dialogue um, with capability to deliver economic outcomes in countries that are much more available and actually less stressful to, to work on with uh, like-minded countries. The other thing about like-minded countries, and we talk about diversity and its value in the sort of innovation productivity mix, and I think that's fundamental, is that values at the end of the day do underpin what we're trying to achieve with trade and with our economies. And so, you know, there are coalitions of like-minded nations who can do things together with data because they trust each other more than, than others. And I do think that's a valuable and worthwhile source and, and, and frame for our, our thinking. So, so I'm, I'm sort of less, less, less excited about FTA than other forms of economic collaboration. On, on, can I, if I may just build on that, what, what is, um, you're, you're absolutely right. And 
And this is where the whole values part of Britain, it's so important that we take for granted that we are and have been respected around the world for our sense of values, I mean, in, in, particularly in, in terms of rule of law, when it comes to getting a, a, a trial, which country would people all around the world come to to get the fairest and the best quality trial and get fair judgment? It's the UK. So we must retain that reputation. It's very, very important. But in terms of values, what about the Commonwealth? Over 50 countries that we have, with a country like India, 1.3 billion, to small Caribbean islands and, that are members of the Commonwealth. And the whole of the Commonwealth put together at the moment makes up less than 10% of Britain's trade. The potential there is is huge. Chris, you're silent. Chris, Chris you're, you're mute. mute. You're muted, Chris. You're silent. <laughs> oh, I am. Thank you for that. Royston, I, I just see a question coming in from Royston Flood. Um, um, Royston, if you have a comment to make, if you could keep it brief, because we are tight for time. I'm opening your mic now. I think. Royston, can you hear us? Nope, that's not going to work. Okay, we're going we're gonna to move on. Um, oh, it's, it's yep. yeah. uh, yes, please. Okay. Um, really, the, uh, the key that I wanted to say is that um, Brexit is a challenge, but you have to look at other countries like Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew. One of the key things was a long-term strategy. Um, we haven't got that. We have a sort of a pass the ball type of strategy. Um, we, I sat on, on Pitcom. I, uh, I live in Switzerland, uh, and it's uh, an interesting viewpoint. And I, I was at Davos and uh, a number of other things. And uh, I think we have to try and get a, a more sane strategy on, on I, IT and digitalization. I mean, for example, the health service, you can't... Uh, it's financially unviable unless we can create a preventative strategy. Uh, in China, they managed to do a complete province in a year, um, which is more, the population was greater than the UK. In education, we need to look at smart learning where we're not dependent upon conventional one-to-one uh, -one teaching. It's an integration of one-to-one -one internet and, and uh, peer group learning. Uh, again, an example there is in Russia, they're doing a five-year math syllabus in one year. And uh, when you look at enterprise, the, the Mittelstand in Germany is the reason why Germany has been so resilient due to, through numerous crises. So, um, we haven't really got that in the UK. So, sorry, Ross, so, I guess the, the, the overall long-term strategy, do we have one? Um, do, do well, any, I haven't seen any evidence of it, shall we yeah. say. So, so, so to the panellists, do, do you see a kind of strategy here uh, which the government is following, or are we literally making it up as we go along? I've, I've not seen any any substantive strategy. I mean, we've got Dominic Cummings talking about creating a, a UK version of DARPA, the American uh, government's uh, state-backed innovation sector. But we, I mean, we've just uh, sold uh, one of our greatest assets, which is ARM, which, exactly. the, uh, which, which frankly was, which, which, by the way, which you mentioned earlier, someone mentioned earlier, if you can make uh, a, an iPhone, then you can find markets. Well, there are four uh, four ARM chips inside the iPhone, and that company is no longer a UK-owned company. So, um, you know, <laughs> the point is, with the currency, by the way, with currency uh, fluctuations and the, the pound obviously going to become cheaper, um, although that, may, that investment may flood into the UK because we will be seen as a more capitally efficient nation to invest in, those companies are not necessarily going to be UK companies. Uh, we'll be seen as a, a place for innovation, yes, talent, yes. But will those companies actually be UK owned? I'm not sure. Uh, David, I, I know you're not in government now, but until recently you were at the heart of government. What, what's, what's the big picture? Is there one? Um, I think that there are quite a number of plans, for example, for an industrial strategy, for example, for a much stronger focus on uh, uh, apprenticeships and on technical and, educa uh, and vocational education. Um, but I think that two things. But, uh, first of all, the preparation for Brexit and the contingency planning uh, ab against the fallout from no deal and then COVID are putting 
weight or the system of government under unprecedented strain at the moment. People are being shoved from one department to the other. I mean, the, the former head of the, of the civil service, the late Jeremy Hayward, said to me that, you know, he thought that the system was running red hot. Um, and that was, you know, uh, some 18 months ago. So um, that is a real problem. Uh, and it will need very determined political leadership and uh, if, uh, an effective ministerial lead to, to, to actually turn things like the, you know, carbon ambitions into a practical strategy of, of, of the kind that Karen was talking about with the, the, the focus on heat uh, emissions or on te technical and, uh, uh, and vocational education, driving up skilling and reskilling. And I think that the, the other thing that the UK ha has has not got right is that, as well as the point um, Susan made about the the, the, the regional and um, to national imbalance, is that we somehow have to find a way of uh, getting commitments that will take us beyond the four or five year lifetime of a single parliament and government. And the polarisation of UK politics, not as bad as is in the United States, but in the last few years, it's definitely got worse, makes it more difficult still to come up with long term plans because people in business and elsewhere look at this and say, well, how could we be sure any of this is going to last beyond the next general election? So you have to find a way in which to bind in people across the aisle to some overarching ambition and strategy, even if there will be some disagreement still about the detail. Um, you can probably all see on your screen what I can see, that the tyranny of the clock appears to be against us. So I just wanted to, um, uh, Roy, I don't think I can bring you back in now, but I want to ask our, our panelists a, a closing thought from each really about where you think we might be in a couple of years time, where you hope we might be. Maybe Jeffries, you could go first. Yeah, my hope is that when you know, the, the, the excitement dies down, you know, Brexit is done or whatever, and we get to wherever we're going, then, you know, in three to five years' time, we can start to think about putting it back together again in a coherent way where we can take advantage of sort of a more collegiate, collective, global, multilateral, regional approach rather than being sort of desperately focused on linking, you know, control and sovereignty with bilateral trade negotiations to so join up the trade discussion. Susan? Well, I suppose I echo the last two speakers. We, we've got to, uh, so as we get past this, start pulling together again. And that means find common ground across the political parties. Like David, I somewhat despair of that in the current climate. But also common political ground with other economies uh, so that we move forward in a very different way. But I think we are fighting tectonic plates at the moment because we're in a period of tearing apart at almost every level. And I do worry for the UK because I have to say we are seventh largest economy at the moment, headed quite fast for 10th. And that makes us very vulnerable. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping in one minute and 38 seconds we don't all get cut off. In case we do, thank you. But I'm, just gonna, I'm, I'm presuming we can run over by a couple of minutes. Mike, perhaps you could go next. Um, just very briefly, I think that the uh, chaos will play out for another couple of years, unfortunately. I think there's going to be a Brexit brain drain, quite simply. Uh, it's happening now. I can see it at the sharp end of innovators and entrepreneurs uh, leaving the UK, frankly. Um, the only, there are only three things I think that we're going to be able to do to mitigate this. We're going to have to um, maximise our UK investment into R&D, replace horizon, the Horizon Europe programmes. We're going to have to unleash investment uh, in venture capital, uh, un, un, you know, broaden SEIS, etc. And lastly, I think broadband. We've got to get 5G. We've got to get vast broadband networks because, frankly, there's kids in, the, kids in their bedrooms building the next a big startup, but they don't have access to fast internet. They don't have access to, to great technology. So we've got to do that as well. Karen Villamoria. We've got to continue to be an open economy, continue to be one of the top three recipients of inward investment in the world. And with proper leadership, which we've shown we can do with vaccines, for example, Oxford University, AstraZeneca, Serum Institute in India, global collaboration, we know we can do it with proper leadership and allowing business and government to work together and collaborate. And David, last word, again, it comes back to leadership, doesn't it? Hey, yeah, I, yeah, and I, I bind everything Karen has, has just said. I hope we'll end up in a couple of years with a close strategic partnership with the EU on both commercial and political things uh, as part of this so-called new D10 Alliance of Democracies, 
um, bringing in other like-minded countries around the world with the US that is again recommitted to a rules-based international order and the security of the democratic world and an EU that is, is able to act diplomatically in a way commensurate with its ambitions. We're not seeing that over Belarus at the moment. Well, in, indeed, we're not. And so much, obviously, to talk about. We, we could go on, but uh, at least the technology didn't cut us off. But um, I'd just like to thank all the panellists very much for joining us. Uh, thank you for anyone who is listening. And let's we talk again. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank, thank, you, very you. Much. thank, thank you. Thank you very much.